It's, it's hard, uh, but uh, uh, it, it, tonight, as you can tell, a lot of the questions were a lot more, a lot more longer, a lot more uh, very technical. So therefore, I think it's, you're seeing a lot more longer responses. I appreciate y'all's patience with that, but at the same time, I feel like that uh, this is uh, these kids' is nights, nice, and I want to try to honor that and try to make sure that the panelists have an opportunity as much as possible. So I appreciate y'all's patience with all that, and that's just the way I look at it. I don't want to be so stern, uh, but I want to try to help uh, it be a really good experience for the for the students. So I, just, I appreciate that. I just want to let you know why it's kind of going a little long, but ultimately, as you can see, it definitely is worth it. Um, so um, I want to uh, welcome you to the the last uh, thesis and. Um, and I'll have some closing things afterwards, and we'll do some things afterwards, and just everybody can kind of stay uh, where they're at once they get done with it. But let me uh, go ahead and introduce the panelists to you at this point in time. We have Nathan Fruit uh, with us, and we have uh, Tom Phillips with us, and then we have Jackie Dempsey with us as our panelists. And uh, just so thank you for y'all's service, and I know that the students really do appreciate you. Um, and so, um, I want to talk about uh, Jimmy Blizzard, and he's going to be the one coming up here for a minute. It has been awesome uh, to see him uh, this year. Uh, I haven't had a Blizzard in my class, and uh, it's, just been, it's just been great. I, I'm a fellow, fellow talker, uh, and so no, in other words, I was tracking with Jimmy pretty well, to be honest with you, because that's just the way I was. And, what I'm doing is what I'm doing, I guess. I, I, I like to talk. Uh, but I really enjoyed, uh, the great thing about Jimmy, if there's anything going wrong or anything that needs to be solved like really fast, Jimmy's your guy. Uh, I mean, and I, he just will uh, tackle anything, uh, even Apple products. Uh, <laughs> I wasn't sure, this was totally the wrong too, by the way. I just like, since my last time with you, one of my last few times, uh, I'm an Apple user, he is not. It's been very clear all year. <laughs> but no, it has been awesome to hear because I have a tech background as well. And it's just been awesome uh, you know, talking with Jimmy and just seeing the whole class grow in different ways. Everyone added something different to this entire class experience. And, uh, and I appreciate you, you know, Jimmy, and all that you've done. And looking forward to hearing you. Uh, so without uh, further ado, I'm going to actually call him up, and then he will deliver a, an abstract for you all, the audience, for a little bit. Um, and after he gets done with that, then the uh, panelists will take over and ask their questions. So board games have been one of my favorite things for a while. So let's play one right now. I have this card here, and on this card there are five different words. I have absolutely no clue what any of the five words are. I'm gonna go ahead and pick a number. Let's do it now, two. Everyone look at the word, look at it. Your goal as the judges is to try and get me to guess that word right there, number two. So you're gonna have to write one word, it can't be two, it can't be the word that's on there, on the little whiteboard that I gave you, and I have to guess this. Your goal is for me to guess this. You have to be creative enough that it doesn't share a type with anyone else. It can't be the same words. Otherwise, you guys are gonna take it away. So I'm gonna turn around, and y'all are gonna compare your answers, and if there's any two that are the same, take them away. So I have no idea. Um, I'm gonna just 
look at it and we'll see what it is and let's see. Australia. Oh my <laughs> Australia! Alright, I get some of the clues now. And this is something like how a board game could go. Now, some of y'all might think that was a waste of time, but hang with me for a few minutes and I'll show you that it was not. Good evening, my name is Jimmy Blizzard, and this is my senior thesis on board games and the value that they bring to society. Board games have been around for centuries, from determining the will of false gods all the way in the BCs, all the way up to even today, getting together at a night to play board games with your friends and family. Board games hold value in three key ways. They hold value in education, in emotional maturity, and in social interaction. First way we see board games hold value is in education. Now, there are many games that provide ways to help you develop your critical thinking skills. However, one such um, subject that helps you develop your critical thinking skills in school, specifically, is math. And now, math can be a little bit tricky for some people to grasp. However, there is a game called Prime Climb where you are trying to reach the prime number 101 by rolling two dice, adding, subtracting, multiplying, or dividing your way up to that prime number 101. This is a very fun and interactive way that you can teach your kids some math skills as well as be able to achieve that critical thinking aspect that is so important for life. Now, there are other games that can help do this. This is just one example. Second way we see is an emotional development. Now, board games give you a safe way to give you real life experiences of your emotions. When I was very young, I used to cry after every time I lost a board game because I was so competitive. I wanted to win that game so bad. But whenever I would lose, I would cry. One year, my dad got invited to this big convention called Dice Tower. And Dice Tower is where hundreds of people gather together to play board games from sometimes three or four in the morning all the way to one or two a.m. And it's just a great way to connect with other gamers. And I wanted to go because I love board games. Now, when my, I asked my dad, hey, can I go with you? He said, no. I was like, why, why can't I go? I like board games, you, you know? And he said, it's because I cried after every time I lost a game. He gave me examples. like, if you had just won a game, and I started to cry. How would that make you feel? Pretty upset, you know, it's just a game. Like, I don't, I don't want to make you feel bad for losing, uh, you know, just some fun that we were trying to have. Well, that made me realize and see that board games can help you take control of your emotions. Now, it wasn't right away, it took some time, but eventually I learned to be able to control my emotions and even congratulate the winner for winning and still have a fun time while doing it. The final way board games are valuable to uh, uh, are valuable is their social uh, life that they bring to our world. Kel a therapist, Kelsey Nemo, says board games have saved my marriage countless times. In fact, I have believe I believe it has done my clients much good for using these board games. When he asked the question, what do you do to spend time together? Usually he would get the response of, oh, we watch this show together at night, or oh, there's this really good Netflix movie that we watched two nights ago. However, that is not really spending time with one another. And board games, as you will see through the rest of the night, are valuable. And that game we played in the beginning, that broke the ice. It set the tone for the rest of tonight to show you that there are that there is value in playing board games. And it helped us to develop a relationship over something that you didn't know we could develop a relationship over. I believe we should remember something Einstein has said. Play is the highest form of research. So board games aren't a waste of time. They aren't just a pastime. Board games are an investment of time. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to start you off with um, 
think about using your comparison tool after the end of this question, okay? So with the creation of online forums and games that are out there today, where they maybe have taken over the traditional board games like chess, you can do chess online and stuff like that. Um, do you feel that these forums are equally beneficial to the population or less, to a lesser degree um, than what you would do in person, yeah? And so using your comparison tool, how, how would you compare those two, which is more beneficial and then, as a follow-up, I'll ask you the next part, so I'm just saying. So, um, yeah, in my third point, as I talked about a little bit there, I say that they're beneficial to the social life and how they bring people together and how it's a great way to develop friendships. You can't really do that on online. And many times when you're playing an online game, you'll be playing against an AI or some kind of bot. And so you don't get that human interaction, or even if you are playing against a human across the screen, you rarely have opportunity to talk about your life, about your situations, like you would if we were face to face. And like we had here, we all had a great laugh when I didn't you know, know what a dingo was. However, if that was done over online, we couldn't have that laugh together and we couldn't enjoy the fellowship of each other. Okay, so then how would you advocate and steer kids who are just like glued to their phones and iPads, steer that generation away from the online and more towards the face-to-face -face settings? So yeah, that could be done in a couple of ways. I think however the most effective way to do this would be through the use of people, you know, just being more aware of the hobby. Because a, a lot of people aren't aware of the hobby, or most of the time, whenever I was telling people I was doing this project, some people were like, well, that's a kid's thing. And even in my introduction, I used an example, board games are for kids. And yes, that's absolutely true. However, they also do provide benefits to adults. And so making the hobby more aware, as well as also restricting the time that you're spending on your phone and as well as the time that you're spending um, through, even if it's a board game on your phone, you know, that can still be beneficial. However, just directing more towards in-person um, actions. Excellent. Congratulations, Jimmy. You should be very proud of yourself. I think you talk about something very profound on page five of your paper where you say that board games provide a fun and safe environment to take risks and make mistakes from which you can learn. It is a mistake to think that there is any profound truth or importance in a game strategy itself. It is what it relates to that matters the most. So in our generation and in your generation, I would say that making mistakes is not something that our culture is comfortable doing. So why is it important that we can admit and learn from our mistakes, and how is this translated into your non-gaming life? So, yeah, so with people always being scared of their perfect face that they have on social media and other apps as such, they don't want to diminish it through making mistakes. However, mistakes is one of the common ways people can grow and have grown. It's just how do you take that mistake? Do you just try and bury it, or do you try and you know, learn from it and grow through it. I've seen this through personally to answer the second part of the question is, I'm not really scared to make mistakes in front of people because uh, I know, you know, some, it's something I can laugh off, it's something that we can all look back in, you know, a high school reunion in 20 years and be like, <laughs> remember when you did that 20 years ago? And we can all have a great laugh from it. And, you know, it's, one of the key things that this generation has taken away is the ability to have fun even while making a mistake in a game or you know, some other way. All right, Pedro, so continuing and building on that thought, you continue on um, between pages eight and nine um, with this quote from Hansen talking about that board games also give an opportunity to, uh, to take risks and to try something different. Um, and then um, after following up that, making the, the, the claim that as you play board games more and more, uh, you will grow in confidence and that can also lead into, um, into other um, aspects of life. Uh, I would 
just curious, because I know not all of your research always makes it into a paper. Um, what else did you see um, that in, um, from this quote that would also follow up to that claim, either from your research or own personal experience and how board gaming can build confidence? Yeah, so um, the, quote, the quote kind of makes it pretty clear that board games do make you grow in confidence. However, they can help you grow in many different um, aspects as well. Like the overarching theme that this is under is emotional maturity. And in emotional maturity, a lot of people kind of lack that these days. And through the use of playing board games, it helps you to be able to think. And going back to even a little bit of education, it helps you to be able to think. So it develops some other great aspects for your life that you need in order to be successful. And I even believe that um, Maslow and his hierarchy of needs talks about this a little bit that's referred to earlier in the same point. Okay, so on to piggyback Tom a little bit on page five where it talks about um, the ability to take risks and in a safe space you can do so. So our country has a lot of debt, right? And in general, we advocate for instant gratification and um, this idea that you, you are entitled to have things, right? So in learning financial awareness and you know, wisdom and insight, um, do, you, do you see any benefit or know of any games that promote um, rewarding the refusal of instant gratification during a game and the um, promotion or the rewarding of long-term goal setting or investments. Um, are you aware of any kind that <laughs> could be implemented? Uh, yeah, so a couple of games um, have like in-game scoring. And so there's certain games, I, I can't think of any off the top of my head, I just know the general concept of where you can either turn in those resources that you've collected right now to get the points instantly, or you can save it up for in-game and try and score a whole bunch of points there. Um, actually, one such game that we played this afternoon was Blood Rage, where you can either try and get map dominance and try and score points by having your figures, certain uh, figures die and then come back, or you can go for just trying to get quests by having the most power on one side of the board, and that happens at the end of the turn. So many things can be done in between that that might affect your decision making. However, this kind of promotes that idea of rewarding you for staying in long term. And that's why I won't play Blood Rage. that <laughs> <laughs> short term gratification. So, Jimmy, I, I think you talked about something profound on page 13. And you talked a lot early in your paper about the connectedness with family and with friends. But then, really, I see a change in page 13 where in the second paragraph you start talking about uh, playing board games will help stave off loneliness and build personal relationships. And then you go on to say having a game as a frame of activity allows friendships to build slowly in a less formal, pressure-filled way. And then you share some indications about loneliness and studies. And I couldn't help think maybe about the intersection of your faith and someone new walking into your church and has going to board game conventions and meeting strangers like myself through the board game community and fostering those relationships over time, has it helped you build new faith-based relationship with strangers as well? Um, yeah, so in my personal life, I have some friends that are board games that are also Christian, board games but are also Christians. However, I haven't really thought of the approach of making a connection through the board game and then trying to um, go deeper into a relationship through Christ and being a brother in Christ. Um, so that, that would be something interesting to definitely try and think about, but I personally have not done that. All right, or right at the beginning of your paper, Jimmy, you talk about um, how board games assist in critical thinking. I would talk a little bit about the difference between uh, critical thinking and strategy and see if you can clarify that a, a little bit for us in the audience. Um, you define critical thinking as defined on page two as the art of observing and analyzing information in order to make good decisions. Um, and then you provide the, the, a example of how Memoir 44 
um, which is a you know simulation of World War II battles. You know where it's you're enacting strategy, um, and that as your the example of critical thinking, and then moving on forward um, to that, you dig into a little bit with strategy on um, page five that it differs, and that um, strategy is more forward thinking than critical thinking. Would you mind expounding um, a little bit? Um, on that and clarifying the um, the difference because they could seem just at face value to be a little synonymous. Okay, yeah, so definitely and like you mentioned there how I say a little bit later on is that strategy is more of a th forward thinking. So strategy, you are doing actions currently, um, kind of going back to Miss Jackie's question and the answer towards that, like are you going to go for a whole bunch of points right now in the now, are you going to try and save it for a little bit later to score one big hit later on in the game? And so that would be more of a strategy, whereas critical thinking is um, like in the moment thinking and not really kind of worrying about what your future would be, as well as also trying to have a logical train of thought as you're trying to accomplish your action as well. I mean, strategy includes logical train of thought because you have to make good decisions now and later. But you're thinking of ahead as well as the present. So, um, for example, you might decide, okay, I'm not going to buy this car now. I might buy it later when it's going, gone down in price. Or maybe with the stock market, I'm going to sell later on because of these predictions and these certain things. That's critical thinking. It's like, well, it's at its peak now. I'm gonna sell it right now because it makes me the most amount of money, rather than taking into account what you have learned in the past and the patterns that you've seen through it. Also on page twelve, when you uh, quote Dr. Dufresne's book, Family Treasures: Creating Strong Families, I loved the six major qualities that successful and strong families have and they are exhibited across all cultures. And they include enjoyable time together, appreciation and affection for one another, positive communication, spiritual well-being, including values, beliefs, and life skills, successful management of stress and crisis, and commitment to each other. So I cannot honestly remember the last time I've seen an ad for a board game. I'm we're probably more so on like Netflix and stuff like that. We don't watch commercials the way I did growing up, but I cannot remember seeing an ad for any kind of a family-focused board game. So with all those very strong selling points that you could easily use while playing games, you get all six of those. Um, do you think that there is something sinister behind um, the lack of promoting board games and the more thrusting of electronic games towards our culture and generation? That, that is a very interesting question. I would think that there is probably something behind there, especially with um, uh, stuff like Board Game Arena. It's coming more and more, and people are using it more and more, as well as Tabletop Simulator, where it's online gaming. And so, you aren't getting that human interaction. And um, even as we heard a little bit about the transhuman movement, how there's a differ in classes or there's going to be, that I think this is trying to move us away to start bringing in other things um, in our lives. And everyone, every year, every phone company always upgrades their battery. Why is that? To get you to spend more time on your phone, to get you to be able to get what you want done rather than what you need. Excellent. Sounds like you're talking about board game expansions as well. I like that. So um, on uh, page 19 of your paper, I think you talked about something that's, that's really interesting. In that you talk about we need to bring board games into nursing homes, hospital wards, and workplaces because they reduce stress and boost happiness, increase self-confidence, and increase uh, control over emotions. Can you, that was a very interesting statement, can you tell me a little bit more about what you were thinking about? Were you thinking that this needed to be something that was informal, done over lunch hours and by volunteers, or are you seeing it more as something that was a structured part of the 
day, maybe intermittent, but it was a formal part of these institutions, uh, daily, weekly, or monthly offerings. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I saw it had a little bit as both um, as a scheduled time during the day for these people who are in the hospital or the elderly to come and just, uh, not have any surgery, not have to worry about the stress of why they're in the hospital or why mm -hmm. they're there. Um, but just to get their mind off real life and to reduce some of the stress that comes from being in the hospital with uh, medical conditions. Um, as well as there was actually someone who worked on a strategy for this, specifically for education in the library. He would have a dedicated time that he would be there from you know, 2 p.m. to 6 p.m. And from that entire time, he would accept kids and he would play board games with them. And it actually was shown that those kids who went to those hours, their test scores actually improved. Um, and so I was thinking of it uh, probably more on the structured side. However, the informal side is also going to give that same benefit over, you know, lunch, over, over you know, you're, you're gonna be there and, you know, maybe you speak to a couple of people, you start to develop a relationship and you start to get to know them better. And then, um, you just have that dedicated time and eventually it becomes something formal through the use of, you know, whether it's volunteers or whether you and a couple of your friends who like to game get together and just play board games with these people who have enjoyed it over the time that you've done it. Okay, so Jimmy, as a member of the board game community, which I have your father and your family to thank for, for introducing me to that, um, which I am truly grateful. Um, and enjoyed lots of board games at your guys' uh, table. Um, I appreciated your defense of like some of the common um, either misnomers or issues that people have with board games. They're childish. Sometimes they, you get feel like you're trapped in them, that they take too long, or that they do um, losing them isn't fun when you've invested a, a significant amount of time in the game um, itself. Also, I just wanted to get your input, um, either based on your research and experience. Of another one that I hear often is that they feel like once they start, that they can't stop. You know, in particular TCGs, like you're talking about Magic yeah. the Gathering, um, Kickstarters, which is very popular in the board game community, is like it's you know the collection aspect of it, and like um, people almost can get addicted, you know, yeah. to to board games. So, what um, what did you see this in your research, or what would you say? Um, to someone who brought that against board games and joining the community. Yeah, so that's definitely a real risk and a real uh, reality. In fact, me, through myself, I have probably spent too much on Magic the Gathering specifically. Um, I, through this argument that they would use, it's a definitely a valid one and definitely one to uh, worry about. Um, however, they are probably saying this because they don't want to get into the hobby themselves. They're making an excuse so that they don't have to do it because they know that if they get into it, then they're gonna have to do that. However, they also <coughs> probably um, don't know the value of it. And many people will say, well, you know, I'm, after I get into it, I'm gonna spend lots of money on it. Yes, that's true. Yes, that's probably a real concern. However, the value that if you get out of it is greater than if you weren't to get into it at all. And it's, in my mind, there is, the benefit is worth the cost. I think on page 17 is where I'm gonna reference this next part. I really liked how you added like counter thesis or reputation for your you know, thesis of what people might say against you. But spe specific, specifically regarding the stress levels um, where you state our brains are processing imaginary losses as real ones. I thought that was, I'd never heard that before. And for those who didn't read the paper, could you explain to them a little bit that stance, which is a valid point to make, and why you would say, that's okay, I, I still believe it's more valuable to play the game and endure that stress. Yeah, so um, the point that she's talking about is 
um, a very popular uh, doctor says, our brains are processing imaginary losses as real ones. Well, that's just it. Once engaged, our brains really don't know it's just a game. So whenever you were to lose a game, um, he's talking about that the same portion of your brain is triggered as if you were to lose, let's say, $100,000 in real life, as if you made an investment and it didn't return, you lost money on it. The same part of the brain is triggered when you actually lose a game. However, um, later in the study, he also does talk about how the same part of the brain that's triggered um, or if you won a lottery ticket for $2 million is also triggered if you win a game. So there's an easy fix to this, that if you're really worried about your mental health declining because you're just losing every time you play, you can play co cooperative games where everyone's working together to try and get to a common goal, and that will give you, and you can even modify it yourself to make sure you win every single time. So that will give you that, um, mind state of a win every single game you play as if you won the lottery for two million. You talk in your paper about uh, the finite amount of time that board games can take. So there are yes. board games that take from 15 minutes to some that take 90 minutes or two hours. And then you talk a lot about the binge culture, right? About sitting down to watch one episode of a Netflix show and all of a sudden it's four or five episodes. Uh, later. Why do you think the finite time is important? And then I would also say, do you feel that sometimes the time limits of these games are off-putting to some people as compared to sitting down for a show or uh, something that they may think is shorter but it's not? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, definitely it's there is definitely uh, the time uh, limits that are put on the outside of boxes are um, kind of discouraging for some people because they see a game, well, this game's 90 minutes, this game's two hours. I don't want to play that. I don't have time in my day for two hours. However, whenever you're doing something like a show, you're like, oh, I got time for a 20 minute episode. I have time for 45 minutes to sit down. I have an hour and a half, you know, it's nighttime. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to work in the morning, sure, but it's not till 8 a.m., right? Um, I got time for this hour and a half. So with that, you don't really realize, and whenever you're having fun, you don't really realize the time. So whenever you watch one episode, you're like, oh man, that was just so good, we gotta watch another one. Oh man, that second episode was just so good, we gotta watch a third one. And eventually, like you said, you passed, and now it's three hours that passed, which was intended to be 20 minutes. And whereas the finite times on games, you can pull them out during lunch, playing with your coworkers, everyone has a great time, and you all go back to working. Sure, you all might want to play one or two more games. However, it just has that great time constraints on it so that you can do that stuff. Whereas if you were to watch an episode at lunch, you know, it's 45 minutes, well, there's, you know, the, you know 75% of your lunch time is taken up. And then you're like, oh, I can squeeze in, you know, just the first 15 minutes of the other ones, and then you show up late for work. And so definitely having a finite time on games is something that's beneficial for the hobby as well as as a great way to pass the time, uh, even if it's just at night before you go to bed. So, Jim, I know, I remember hearing earlier this year, you know, when you shared with me about this project, and actually one of the first thoughts that came to my mind is, I wonder how much research he's going to find on this topic, and I was thinking, good luck with that, my friend. And so I'd be just curious to hear, because I, obviously you have done it, um, really enjoyed, you know, reading through this, and um, really your personality came through it as well. I kind of sometimes even heard your voice in my head, as interesting as that sounds as you're reading it, and um, you, really, you really came through in this. So I, but I'm curious to hear, uh, what limitations or challenges did you find as you researched and put, you know, put this project together? Yeah, so I, I can definitely say I was surprised at how much research was out there. The limitation came to be when it was an actual study. 
before when it was a credible source, I actually had a hard time getting access to the actual studies themselves, and eventually I gave up on trying to get the study itself. Um, so there are some studies done, and actually a lot of the information I found was pertaining to education and children themselves through the use of board games as an education. In fact, there's um, a school, I believe I referenced it um, earlier, that uses mostly board games to help teach their children enrolled in the school for um, uh, education and to help them learn those life skills that's absolutely required. Um, I actually, uh, near the end of my research, I found an article on how board games um, enhance our spiritual life which I thought was very, very interesting, and I didn't have time to include it in my paper. I, I also didn't really have time to dig deeper and dig, you know, is this only one guy saying this, or is this like a collective thing? Um, but I definitely, there's a lot more out there than I thought, and then probably anyone is thinking how much, you know, because I kind of thought the same thing. It's like, oh, I might have a hard time. I might have to broaden it to games in general are beneficial, and one of the my proofs would be for games. But there's just such a wealth of knowledge out there. Um, okay, so you mentioned the spiritual aspect of board games, and my next question has to do with that. Um, there are so many stresses today in life, right? And um, from what you know about Jesus and him being our Sabbath and resting in him, how can you draw a parallel or a connection between playing board games and resting in Christ? Okay, that is a very interesting. Um, so board games, they definitely take your focus off of the real world. They, you know, sometimes through the use of games like D and D, they put you into this fictitious world that you might, you know, it's not actually existent. Um, however, um, whenever we're studying our Bible, whenever we're praying, we're taking ourselves outside of the world, outside of the busyness of our job, of our emails, our text messages, and having that one-to-one -one time with him in not a fictitious world, but a very, very real world. Um, and so that could be one way you could look at it. Another way you could potentially look at it is um, through using through kind of the same process. Jesus tells us not to be, you know, not to be in the or do not be conformed to the world. And um, board games just help you, um, you know, like like I kind of said earlier, is take your mind off the world. They help you try not to conform to that because many people don't even know about the autonomy that exists. And so it has them dead. Um, uh, while there are some uh, board games out there that are harmful and that have really evil stuff in it, it hasn't been affected by the world as much as something like social media or a video game through the use of you actually are a character going out and hunting demons through the game, through the use of a game like Doom. Excellent. Jimmy, on uh, page 12, you talk about different types of board games and you talk a little bit about cooperative board games, which those of us that are in the hobby know what they are, but I would ask that you explain for the audience maybe a little bit about what cooperative board games are. And I think it's great that you cite there that because families live in a busy world, finding time to spend together can be diff difficult and maximizing that time is important. These memories come from spending time as a families and friends and far outweigh memories spent of time in isolation. So I'd ask you to talk a little bit about co-op games. And then also during COVID, many, many people felt isolated, but we also saw an explosion in the sales and play of board games, almost like we've never seen. So can you talk a little bit about the togetherness that you see in the board games outside of the strategy, the combat, the winning, um, and what's that, what that's meant to you and your family, and maybe uh, how you used board games through COVID in that crisis? Okay, absolutely. So a cooperative game 
um, is where you and a couple of other people, and it can be many, many people, are together trying to work towards one goal. An example that I give is a game aimed through Mice and Mystics, where it's a great, fun, light family theme, where you're these mice trying to defeat the evil rat kingdom. And it's just something super fun to play with the family, and we've been a great time to get together to learn a little bit more about each other while still having an active time and still not just sitting there around the TV or around looking at your phone, you know, sending me to each other every two minutes whenever you find a great one to find. And um, uh, cooperative games are specifically a lot of people don't really like them because there isn't that competitiveness. However, they provide a great place in the hobby for those people who aren't competitive. And so they are essential for the box board game hobby to survive and thrive. Speaking through the personal experience through COVID, I know a lot, uh, my family played quite a few, um, probably more than I realized, board games throughout that entire crisis. And um, it helped pass the time. It helped make the days, you know, not straight together and you're not waking up doing school, going back to sleep, doing it all over again. You're not waking up, you know, playing on your game system like many people did. Um, you're doing an active sport, I, and I say sport as in um, not physical, you know, running, but exercising of your brain to help pass the time rather than just sitting there and watching, you know, however much long episodes of an anime or the new season that was released or watching the entire Marvel series from start to finish. Um, and so it was a great way to help pass the time as well as to help um, enjoy the, uh, the crisis we were in even though it was something not to be enjoyed. And it's something that you could do even if you were sick. You know, you didn't have to just sit there in bed all day. You can, you know, get up and, you know, maybe sometimes distance yourself from your family, but still have a great time playing board games. And so I really appreciate the story that you included in your abstract, you know, about your dad, you know, coaching you through how to take losses well um, as a father of little girls who don't like to lose board games either. I appreciated that. So I know that board games have been a part of your life. I mean, I think Blizzard is almost synonymous with board games. I mean, at this, um, at this point. So I'm, I'm just curious, with being so knowledgeable about the hobby, um, was there anything new that you learned that benefited you as you went through this project? And was there anything else that you'd like to share with us in the audience of how board games have also helped you to grow as as a person, as it's a you know part of your family and personal life? Uh, yeah, definitely. So. Um, board games have really shown me that there's um, there's a great way to spend time outside of the screen, and I'm not been, I've not been much of a sports guy. I do taekwondo and jujitsu, and sometimes it's fun, sometimes it's not. I've never really been big on soccer, football, or anything. So my main hobby was to go on my computer or on my phone or tablet and play a game there. However, you know ever. Uh, I've through the use of this, I've realized that there's been much more benefit at my fingertips rather than a screen. And you know, at first when I started to do this paper, I was like, okay, there's probably some benefit to it. But you know, as I said, I probably was thinking I might have to put it under a proof and then subgroups under that and just proof gaming in general. However, because of the wealth of knowledge, there is just so much that you can talk about that there have that you can't include it all into one um, one thing. However, I liked the very last thing, or one of the very last things in my conclusion. I say um, that board games hold value in education, emotional maturity, and uh, through sociability. And then I. I put in this poem that says, I tried to teach my child with books. He gave me only puzzle books. I tried to teach my child with words. They passed him by, often unheard. Despairingly, I turned aside. How shall I teach this child? I cried. Into my hand, he put the key. Come, he said, play with me. Now, this poem probably is referring to dolls, trucks, something else. However, it could also be referring to board games. And 
through the use of board games, you get much more benefit through the critical thinking skills they provide, through the emotional maturity that you have, and through the friendships that you can develop. I even have Tom Phillips here. We have a relationship and a friendship over board games, and I don't think he would be sitting here unless it were for the fact of my love and his love for the hobby of board games. Okay. Um, okay. <laughs> you did so good, Jimmy. I'm so proud of you. Um, it was such a blessing to be up here, and I'm honored, and I'm very thankful that you chose me to be a panelist. I love board games, and um, I see the great benefits and rewards for sitting around the table and playing them with family and friends. Um, you are so good with people, honey. <laughs> you really engage people and draw people to you. You have a really good job of emitting joy and enthusiasm. Um, I think that you're super confident and as you go off to college or in your next adventure, um, you should really consider piggybacking a Bible study and your love for the Lord and then conclude the evening with board games because you'll get the best of both worlds there and you have a lot to offer with your knowledge of the Bible and God's word and um, just connecting people. So, good job. I love Thank you, you, buddy. Thank you. Jimmy, you rocked it. You did a great job. And, and I don't think you have to worry about crying anymore to losing to your dad at board games because I don't remember the last time your dad won a board game when he played. <laughs> thought I would say that. But I, I have to say, in all seriousness, I've known you for five years. Board games are what brought us together. And watching the boy that you were and the man that you have become has been my greatest honor. So congratulations on becoming a fantastic man. Everyone who knows you, who I talk to, describes you as the epitome of the true gentleman. And I think that speaks volumes to your parents and the values that you have. So congratulations on that. I will finally say you are an ambassador of your hobby, you are an ambassador of your faith, and you are an ambassador of your family. And I'm happy to know you. Congratulations, and I look forward to watching your future. Thank you. Along those same lines, even was sitting at a table with you earlier this afternoon and actually get demolished in a board game by you, sir. Um, just the pleasure of knowing you for goodness um, a while. You know, seeing you as a young boy, now the young man that you've become, it is a, a privilege to you know serve alongside you in ministry, to enjoy just being family friends, um, even though there's some distance between us in geographic and age. Though I'm always encouraged, you know, even though you probably doubled my score, you know, just enjoy you know being there at the table, laughing, growing the relationship, you know, that we have, you know, over that, you know, over that board game. So as you um, as you continue, you know, obviously you, this has played a part in addition just to your, your beliefs um, and your family. You're just a very well-rounded young man, and I'm just very excited what the Lord's going to do as you continue in ministry. And I, I'm confident, as you've been encouraged already, that board games will probably play some, some part of that in some way. But, you know, always been impressed with your willingness to go, you know, I am. Um, and go out and just sit down with somebody that you don't even know and just bond with them. Um, that's something that I envy because it's not something that I have. So um, continue with that. And, you know, like has been said, being that ambassador, um, not only for the hobby, but also your faith. And um, you are, the world is a better place because you are in a young man. So congratulations on this achievement. Thank you.